We've got four speakers remaining, and I'll just introduce our our first two, um, Uncle Eric Lawrence and Sa uh, oh, sorry, Uncle Eric Law and Sally Lawrence next, but, and then we'll have two final speakers. But Uncle Eric Law is a proud Waka Waka man who is a Vietnam veteran and son of one of our Barambar boys, and we've heard plenty of discussion this morning about the boys of Barambar. A World War One soldier. His father was uh, Vincent Law, a World War I uh, soldier. Uncle Eric's esteemed career spans 42 years, which includes such roles as in education as a teacher, as a principal of the school, and now the chairman of the Queensland Catholic Education Group. Other leadership roles held by Uncle Eric include being the only Aboriginal superintendent of Sherberg and mayor of Sherberg. Fittingly, Uncle Eric Law is the chairperson for the ANZAC 100 Boys from Barambar project. Sally Lawrence has spent the last 15 years working in and with boys, uh, with both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in a number of different roles. She is currently on maternity leave and I understand is expecting a, a second child in about four or five weeks, so... <laughs> uh, She's on leave from, as being the manager for Indigenous Education with the Department of Education, North Coast Region. Over the past six years, Sally has been working with the Sheram, uh, Sherberg Ration Shed Museum on a variety of education projects. These include Auntie Honours, Most Excellent Adventures, the Ration Shed Tours, the School Excursion Programs, the Ration Shed Museum, five educational workbooks, and now the sixth workbook for the boys of Brambar. World War One ANZAC 100 project. Please welcome Uncle Eric Law and Sally Lawrence. Excellent. Um, thank you, everybody. Just the viewer advice at the start there that um, the following presentation does contain the names and images and writings of people who are deceased. And the presentation also consists of documents and language from the protection and assimilation eras, which is racist. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today. Um, lovely welcome there from Ani um, Ruchi Baramba. And pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. And I also wish to pay my respects to the elders, um, both past and present of Baramba Sherberg, and pay my respects to the aunties up there in the back row for all the work that they've done with the Ration Shed Museum and the Sherberg Historical Precinct out at Sherberg. If you haven't been, I'll do a plug for Aunty Anna Cleary as well for her tours, um, but um, you, you need to get out there. It is an amazing display of um, the community's history and story. And I'm feeling very honoured to be able to share this story. Like as we've heard earlier today, it's not my story, um, but I feel very honoured that the elders have trusted me to share um, several of their stories over time. I'm going to come back to that past, present and future because that really shapes our um, project. And just to give you a bit of an idea about um, our um, Boys of Baramba project for the ANZAC 100, it incorporates quite a few facets to it. So we are looking at having an exhibition a travelling exhibition that will go to different communities which will share our story about the boys of Baramba. Um, I'm doing the education booklets and linking that to the Australian curriculum. And I'm really excited about that as an educator for, I don't know, 16 years, I don't know, I haven't got much, you've got more on me, Uncle, but um, is when I work in schools, I continually hear teachers and um, librarians in particular saying, what resources are out there? So um, I feel very honoured to be part of creating that story for the boys of Baramba and getting those curriculum resources into <coughs> schools. We've also got community celebrations, um, looking at one on, at Remembrance Day to start to bring community in, to yarn those stories as you're hearing today. That's one very important facet of this, are the, the oral histories. Um, our honour, our role of honour is... Um, getting an upgrade as well as a web movie and, and more of a web presence. I'll share with you those web details later. So the past, present and future are the real framers for this project. We're looking at the past of those internal and overseas, or so the internal wars, what we're hearing about with the rolling frontier. Um, we're looking at the overseas 
efforts before, like for example, Jerry Jerome, who's a very famous um, man from Sherberg, he was actually reported to have broken in over a thousand horses for the Boer War. So bringing in those stories, even though we are confined in a way to World War I history, we want to you know, build that picture um, of how Baramba Sherberg, um, the history there. We're looking at the World War I volunteers, our boys, the Baramba settlement, how that came about, and also the policies that have had that effect, which you've heard about today. The present is the oral histories, and our elders um, are going out and getting those stories from communities. Uncle, you're working with your mob, hey, in particular, up yeah. around the Oldsmobile uh, area? Yeah, I've, I've been a bit lucky because, uh, like I said in the introduction, my father was a World War I veteran. Um, and, you know, it's, he, he passed away at the age of 80, which is very strange for Aboriginal men as well. But I remember sort of talking to him before I headed off to Vietnam. And again, my dad, uh, like a lot of World War I fellows, didn't, didn't say much about the war. But he gave me little snippets of what sort of information and, and what was uh, likely to confront me. I, as I remember, uh, you know, probably Vietnam was a little bit more tamer than World War I because uh, that would have been an absolute brutal war mm. to be involved in. But all these oral histories uh, are important and, you know, we keep talking about collecting these stories and, and making them come alive and I think this is what we're trying to do with this. Uh, one of the processes we're finding now, we're finding, I knew for a fact that my uncle, my father's brother, went to war the same time as my dad. But on our honour roll, it's only my dad's us there. So now what we're finding is that there are other men who actually uh, went to war that uh, are not featured on our honour roll. Uh, and there's a little story about our honour roll as well as how, how it came to fruition and stuff like that. So, and you know, the ration shed has really been the driving force behind all this of keeping our history in, uh, in Baramba Sherberg and uh, sharing that with people and, and think this is what we we particularly want to do. And as a teacher, I'm very interested in how we involve the schools in it because we're talking about our past, our present and our future, and those are the kids that uh, mm. uh, we need to make sure that they keep this sort of momentum going and, it, and they don't stop. Mm. Uncle's just touched on um, the community and the school's involvement. And um, I just want to backtrack for one second and acknowledge we talk about the research path and um, I, there's a lot of people in this room that have um, really guided us on our journey and it started with Wesley Enoch and a conversation with him to then point us in the direction of Gary Oakley, Philippa Scarlett, um, Desi Crump and um, Steve Eaton who's up there next to Gary. And for people that are looking at developing their story, I've just found a huge amount of generosity and time afforded to me by these people and other organisations to assist. So um, I just want to acknowledge that. Steve Eaton from the RSL um, is working with us on developing a, a program that he has had going for a while, um, which enables primary school children and high school children to further research um, diggers that are attached to the town in which that school is closest to from the War Memorial and he's got a great project there. So if you want to find out more, I know you don't want any more work, <laughs> Steve, but uh, I'm plugging you there. Um, the future part of this framework is that greater recognition of Indigenous involvement in the AIF, World War I and subsequent campaigns, that curriculum provision which I'm excited about in getting and embedding um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives into the curriculum, and as we just said there, that local student involvement. One of, one of the things I, I want to make people aware of is that uh, in our community of Sherberg, uh, you know, we hear a lot of horror stories about, uh, you know, young Indigenous children running rampant and smashing things and doing graffiti and whatever. The War Memorial at Sherberg is probably one of the places that's not been touched. Mm. And, it, and it's been, it's, it's stayed in that sort of pristine condition and you know we've been not so much lucky but people t 
tend to respect it, especially the young children. And I think with this project now, what we've got going, that will then bring them back in a lot more. But as we're finding out with our honour board, we need to make sure that we're, we're changing that and updating it because it's not <coughs> uh, particularly relevant. And there are some names, there's a lot of names that we're finding out that's, mm. that, that should be on that role. You can see some of the stories and the themes that we're um, looking at through this project that have come up as we've started to look at the boys of Baramba and look at our story um, in that broader context about the honour roll, as Uncle's saying, the Defence Act, which you've heard about today, the Patriotic Fund, um, where there was effort from the Aboriginal men and women of Baramba Sherberg to raise funds towards the Patriotic Fund. And it's interesting, some of those newspaper clips, when you do get into them, whether you know, how that was done. They were, I guess, seen at Wandai there as a bit of an um, exotic kind of display of culture um, to raise money for the Patriotic Fund. So that itself presents a really great um, learning moment that I can present in these curriculum books to students. Spanish influenza, as Uncle said, we're going to check that bubonic plague and those individual stories and um, oral histories that will come out. So as Uncle said here, our honour roll, it currently has 29 men listed as serving in World War I at the top of the board and men's names for World War II down the bottom. Through our, our uh, research, we've discovered that there was another 16 men who were irregularly enlisted. So that comes back to that Defence Act that we were talking about um, today, <coughs> that they were discharged on account of their Aboriginality. So one of the things that we've met with our committee is... Um, do you want to yarn that one, Uncle, about yeah. acknowledging? Well, what, what we decide on our committee is that we, we need to acknowledge these six men, uh, 16 men who actually did enlist, uh, and for some other reasons beyond their control, they didn't get a chance to uh, carry out the service that they wanted. Mm. So that's why we need to change our honour roll uh, and include these 16 in particular, and probably another five or six that we've picked up in our research. So this um, slide here shows you the, the men whose names are in blue are the ones that we've been able to get their service records. Those in red were unable to find their service records um, or find that connection to Baramba. Um, the interesting part, the top part, is the one that is current um, on a roll. You can see that there's three names in brown. They are part of that 16 group that were irregularly enlisted. So why did those three men get on the honour roll, whereas those other 13 didn't? Through our meetings, and I said to Auntie Ada the other day, lines in the sand, this baby's going to come out, Auntie, if you keep giving me names to research. <laughs> um, we've, we've found another five. and. So George Robert Aitken, Alfred Blackman, I'm going to share with you the Blackman story in a minute, um, Valentine Hare, Douglas Law, family for Uncle here, and um, Gail Simpson, family there for Aunty Ada. So, you know, it's been exciting and, and I guess that's a, a great outcome for our project is to acknowledge those men. We've seen the Defence Act today. So telling our story, lots of visits, uh, lots of research and... Um, just last weekend, went up to see Animari Wilkinson, who is the uh, matriarch of the, her family. She's um, related to the Blackman mob, to get permission to share this story. So Thomas Blackman, I can research him. I can find his um, history, his service records. I can find where he went, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Doesn't tell me much about the man himself. And as you're hearing today, it's those oral histories that really bring um, it alive. So he was one of three Blackman boys. Two, remember, are on the honour roll and one isn't. So Alfred, the fellow closest to me, is not on the honour roll. But Thomas Blackman and Charles Tedney Blackman do appear. The interesting part about this story is at the Ration Shed Museum we have a collection called the Caroline Tennant um, Kelly Collection. Now she was an anthropologist a young um, British lady who was out at Sherberg and recorded a lot of the histories. We've come across a letter that um, Thomas Blackman has sent to um, Caroline Tennant Kelly. And this really gives us a great insight and I'd just like to play you that letter.
February the 22nd, 9.35. Dear Madam, I've taken the pleasure of referring to the treatment of half-caste returned soldiers. I returned soldier myself as there were three of us went to the Great War out of my family. One was killed at war and two of us returned after the war was over. I always thought that fighting for our king and country would make me naturalised British subject and a man with freedom in the country but I've hardly had freedom since I returned from the war. I've had no justice at all. I don't know if the king knows about how his half-caste returned soldiers treat in this country. I'm a returned soldier and on the roll and I've had lots of votes and a member of the Labor Party but I see that ain't made me any better off. I was brought to Sherberg May 7th 1934 and still find myself here. Is this the sort of freedom that I went to France and helped go fight? I say no. I want justice. I'm a man that is well liked wherever I worked. I was living at Granville, Maribor and I had my good home broke up by the Chief Protector Aboriginal. It hurts me very much. Yes, it hurts me very much to know that I'm kept down by the Chief Protector. I should think that it's a dirty insult to return soldier. I was exempted from the Aboriginal Act in 1931, but in 1934 I find myself brought under the Act again just for a little bust up between my wife. It's, it was nothing to make a big thing out of. I was locked up for seven days for being intoxicated and using bad language, but it seems the Chief Protector wasn't satisfied with me taking my punishment in the lock-up for seven days, but places me under the Act and puts me to a settlement like a dog. Seems as if the Chief Protector thinks that a half-caste returned soldier don't want justice. I was brought to this, into this settlement and find that the Chief Protector hasn't got any accommodation to my wife. And another thing I find that a half-caste returned soldier's got to get a permit from the superintendent to go about the country we helped to fight for, just the same as some white soldiers did. Think of all the half-caste soldiers that were killed at war. What thanks have the half-caste soldiers got for going to war? We were good men at war, but look down on now the war is over. This sort of thing wants to seen to. No place for a soldier on an Aboriginal settlement kept down all our lives as a prisoner we helped to fight for our king and country and for our loved ones that weren't able to go to war and I suppose we would go again if we were able to. To go again we're only asking for the same justice and freedom. The same freedom as the white returned soldiers as people wants to be in our boots. To know what this Aboriginal act feels like, half our time living on dry bread and tea and see hardly any meat. What little meat we get is no notice. The Aboriginal act is a very poor policy. The Word Protection Act means prison. I'm trusting you do your best, madam, to not turn the soldiers down. Closing with kind regard, yours sincerely, Tom Blackman, Sherberg Aboriginal Settlement, Mergen. So everything, I guess, that we've been talking about today and, and a bit more, he's, he's so um, beautifully articulated in that letter. Um, and it's just, it's gold that, you know, we can bring and start to match up some of our exhibitions out at the Ration Shed and show that, that um, complementary nature of how they support each other. So um, we've got um, exciting times ahead as, as Annie Jeanette and Annie Sandra and Annie Ada, uh, Annie Gracie, Stanley there too, Uncle here, um, going out to the community and making those connections as we've used those service reports to guide us about some of the family connections, but of course the knowledge sits with our elders at Sherberg at the moment. They know the families and they know where to start um, trying to tease out some of those, those stories. Anything else, Uncle? No, no. Uh, the, the only thing I want to say, and it uh, <coughs> probably uh, goes on a little bit more what Dale was talking about with, with monuments. Uh, you know, when we first started off this exercise, we thought that our honour roll at Sherberg was complete and that everybody that should be on there is on there. But now we're finding that that's not the case. So, and in what we did, we, uh, we didn't plan for a new honour on board, but we're going to have to do one. And probably Sherberg's been the uh, one of the first communities to have such a, a, a detail on a roll for, for its uh, World War I veterans. So we want to maintain that, but uh, you know, we're going to have to probably get behind you, Dale, and see if, uh, whatever crumbs has dropped on the floor we might need to pick up and, uh, and make sure that, sure that we have 
put together a, uh, a, a suitable memorial for these fellows who, who went to war. Thank you. And Sally and Uncle Eric will be back later to answer questions. We'll have the four, four uh, speakers together for the last session. Uh, our next speaker, I'd like to invite Rory O'Connor. Rory is the Managing Director of Yugen Bear Museum out in Bean Lee, and everyone would probably start to realise how active that museum has been. Uh, well regarded here in South East Queensland for the positive initiatives it, it is uh, encouraging in keeping the Yugen Bear heritage well alive. Rory is a descendant of Jackie Jackie of the Logan and Pimpama region and also Jenny Graham, a prominent Aboriginal leader. He has authored a number of documents on black diggers, including the booklet, Yugen Bear in Defence of Their Country, uh, dated 1991. So please welcome uh, Rory to the stage. Okay. Can you do that technical thing? Yeah. <laughs> Click on me. Bingo, baby. Balgo uh, Yuan, Jimbalung Wal Mung, which is just to say uh, good afternoon, my many friends in Yugambe. Uh, great honour to be here. Thank you for the welcome. And um, it's just this afternoon we've heard fantastic stories about the the the, the, the plight and the journey of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Um, in their own battles. Today I just want to share two little stories from our community um, that have come along through the years. And I say through the years because I have a letter here and um, it goes back to 1993 where the State Library of Queensland is hosting with Compamere Aboriginal Corporation, that's our little museum, David Hugginson for a speech and also Major Robert Hall. Um, so congratulations to State Library, You've been doing this a long time and it's great to be here following on from all that. Now, let's see if I can figure this out. Just a little bit about myself. This is a uh, mob down at Narang in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and that's um, where my families are from, stretching Yugan Bear country, goes all the way out to the desert, down to the Tweed, coming up towards Brisbane, something like, I think, uh, 6,000 square kilometres in all. And we talked about the Australian War Memorial before. Well, the National Museum of Australia actually has a, an exhibition called Resistance. And it went in about four or five years ago. And the gentleman over on the far side there is um, Jackie Jackie, King of the Logan and Pimpamar, says his uh, king plate there. But um, he was one of the original resistance fighters in that um, he struck a deal with the first missionaries, the Lutheran missionaries in the Logan Bethania area in the 1860s. And that deal was a good one. He brought his family along to Sunday school if the missionary, Dr, oh sorry, Pastor Hausman, could stop them being shot. It was a great deal and it worked. He also got paid for this deal because the pastor got paid for every black soul he saved. Now I thank that man because if he hadn't have done it, I would not be here. Um, and Nelly, his wife, there's a lovely story of her and um, his passionate burial of her in death, but that's alas for another time. His daughter, Emily Williams, took on the fight of protecting the young kids orphaned by the frontier wars. So they gathered the um, kids, remember the pastoralists are coming through between here and what is now the Gold Coast. So they went to the far western parts of their land, places like Christmas Creek, where they could raise the children unmolested from the authorities. And thanks to that thinking ahead, you know, that, that, that resistance, um, you know, we are still here. And the... Uh, the exhibition in National Museum features, I think, five other resistance fighters as well from all that time. So they've been trying on that battle to tell the Aboriginal frontier war story for some time. This is Stan Uke, my grandfather, a rat of Tabuk, Tabrook. As a young man, he was a champion boxer. He fought um, display boxing at uh, the RNA, uh, not the RNA, the Festival Hall in the 1920s uh, and then went on to fight. That's my uh, mother's father. And... If you weren't successful in staying on your land, you often ended up at these missions, like Perga Mission or um, Deeping Creek Mission. There's a, we believe that's uh, uh, Jackie Jackie or Bill and Bill in the, in the front row there. Somehow he got out of that to die, if you like, a, a free Aboriginal man around 1900. Now, I'll take you back 22, 23 years ago. 
Cess Fisher, a great man, a great storyteller, and I'm honoured to uh, recite him here today. He came to my mother and uh, our corporation and uh, my aunt Yasola with a grand plan. 1993, the International Year of Indigenous Peoples, and he wanted, for the first time ever, Aboriginal men and women to march under the Aboriginal flag in an Anzac Day parade. Never been done before, he said. And, they, and we sort of said, yeah, it won't be done either. They won't hear of it. Long story short, um, it was a battle to take it to the Anzac Day Committee. Uh, we fought and got an audience with them to say, look, it's the international year. Um, this is a big gig. And they said, no, you'll want to do it every year. And they can march under their own, um, but their own squad anyway. Uh, and I remember we got to hit a crisis point at the ANZAC committee, the annual committee meeting where they decide what's happening in the next year. And Aunt Yasola had pitched a case, but the crowd was very much against allowing Aboriginal people to put their flag up. It just wasn't going to happen. Uh, I was a young journalist with Murdoch newspapers at the time, and I found myself getting up to talk because I thought we've lost this and that would break so many people's hearts. And I got up and I gave the best speech I could for a 20-something year old um, who was quite intimidated by a really large crowd of angry people. And as I was speaking, I looked over and these guys in leather jackets were glaring at me and they were angry and hostile. And I thought, man, we're just going to get crucified here. I finished talking and it turns out these boys were from the Vietnam War and he got up and he looked at us and he said, and he looked at the room and he said, you bastards wouldn't let us march. You'll let them march. And as a result, we managed to do um, this thing. So this is uh, Cess Fisher's dream. And it was a great, it was a great day. People came from all places. Uh, Ujuru told her story of her, you know, her two brothers who were prisoners of war um, and, and the tragedy. She was almost not allowed to serve either because the recruiting officers said, you'll get taunted too much. You, you won't make it, lady. Well, they didn't quite know who she was. Um, and then Lenny Waters, he was a World War II pilot. Uh, incredible man. He, uh, we found him in a pub at Gundam. Gunda Guy or somewhere, and uh, managed to bring him in for this uh, event, and he became a great hero. He only had grade seven education, but he sat an exam with 374 kids or young men, and he came fourth. So they figured they'd better get him on board. He ended up being a pilot, um, and he said, hated the Americans, saying he turned up for the glory fights and left all the dogfighting to, to his team. Um, great storyteller, a wonderful man. And this is the big day when it turned up. I'll quick, quickly flick through these. It's really just a, a blast from the past. These photos have been in our museum for quite some time, and it's just a nice way to look back at some of the, the characters and the figures that were there. Uh, of course, a lot of them have moved on. Um, but it was a, a tremendous... I guess the early 90s, too, were a, a tremendous uh, coming of age for the whole Aboriginal diggers' story. And there's a proliferation of books and monuments and things that happened around that time. And this was just part of it. I've got a little document here. Uh, Anzac Parade, Brisbane, 25-4-93. Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders marched as a unit for the first time in the Brisbane Anzac Parade in 1993 to mark the International Year of World Indigenous People. Petty Officer Peter Wallen, Royal Australian Navy, carried the Aboriginal flag. Ms Wendy Harold, sister of Vietnam warrior, carried the Australian flag. Unidentified man carried a Vietnam warrior's flag. Gilbert Leving and other young people carried the Aboriginal flag. Uh, Naku Nemuk marched as representative of the Torres Strait Islanders. The project was initiated by Aboriginal poet Cecil Fisher, coordinated by the Combe Mary Aboriginal Corporation for Culture. Now, if you see anyone here or any comments, do come. Oh, there's someone. <laughs> 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 But a lot of these people, amazing stories in all of them, and this was a, a wonderful coming of um, coming together from, of people from all around the place. I think Mum said Reggie Saunders' widow was uh, was was there on that day as well. Now I know we're just a little. This is another little project we've done as well. I'll, I'll, I'll figure out how they do this. Well, there was another special early service for Remembrance Day on the Gold Coast. This morning, Aborigines who served in Australian wars were honoured. For many fighters, war was one of the few times when race wasn't a problem. They just treated me as one of the blokes while I was working. There's no difference. Enlisting wasn't so easy, though. Officially, Aborigines weren't permitted in the army, so many claimed they were islanders. And we'll be thinking of them and all who served on Tuesday, the 11th of the 11th. That's the news. Have a good week. Good night. 
Now, that's a story that started back in the um, 1980s, where uh, members of our community just wanted to think about you know, the Aboriginal men and women from their own community that had, that had served. This is Granny Graham. She's a traditionally scarred lady, born in the, around 1859. My mother grew up in her household, and my mother grew up, uh, along with all her cousins, being roped into working, built, making uh, care kits to be sent over to World War II. So the war was very much something, it was a lived experience for my elders. And uh, we counted no less than 22 of Granny's uh, children and grandchildren served in World War I and II. So this is the Yugan Bear War Memorial. That, that is family members that we know served in these wars, and it is incomplete, um, as we know. And this is the thing, you know, when you do history, you sort of get it wrong, but you eventually get it right. And this is um, a plea from Mr. Hugginson, and this soldier is only known as Tommy of Wurrungaree, which is near Narang, and he'd like to know if anyone has any information about him. We're still looking for information about him, but this is part of the news article that went out back in 1991 when we launched that. Uh, and finally, as part of this journey, I was a young man when our corporation was started. I was a journalism student, so I had the privilege of being the tribe scribe and coming along and taking a lot of these stories down. Uncle Les never uh, got overseas, but um, he used to... He was in World War II, and his biggest crime was sneaking away from camp uh, to play football. He was a fantastic uh, rugby league player um, and really well known in his era. And I said, what happened if you had got caught? And he said, oh, the problem with going AWOL is they shoot you. But he had a rugby league game, game to get to. Uh, one of the other stories, and I'll just relate it briefly because we're out of time. Um, one of our cousins, uh, Gilly Leving, he was, uh, he was a rat of Tobruk, but I interviewed him. And his daughter sat beside us as he told his story. And like many people, he didn't tell all of his story, but he told how he had, um, as a rat of Brook, the things he had seen, the experiences he'd seen. He got yellow jaundice, he came back out, and then he went into the jungles of um, New Guinea. And he said, uh, we had a lot of mates, he recalled, but we also had a lot of casualties, he said sadly. I was so lucky to talk to him. And as I walked out of the room, his daughter said, He's never shared those stories ever. And he died soon after that interview. So it was quite a, a moving thing. But when we talk about gathering these stories, this is the importance of it. And um, we need to pass these on. So his, sorry, Aleving is now the head of our, uh, the chair of our corporation. So the name is very strong. And this is a memorial we put in down the coast at a borer ground at Burley Heads in 1991. It's Uncle Robbie Best there. Got the rock from Mount Tambourine. That's Uncle Arthur Peterson from the north there. The wonderful Marshall Bell was our artist. And this is uh, Jason Sandy. You might know he's the man lying on the ground on the green ants. It's Arnie Asola and Peter Wallen. And just lovely memories of a, of a ceremony that happened back in 91. And it continues to this day. This is Tony Hazel, who's moved on as well, unfortunately. It's beside the local RSL who help us. The Military Brotherhood are part of the show. Um, but most importantly for us, it's about... Um, these little people who make it so special for us. So they learn about poppies, they learn about passing on a tradition, understanding the importance of uh, defending your, your lifestyle and your culture, and um, the, the National Army is involved too, and that's who we do it for. Thank you very much. Thanks, and, and Rory will be part of our final panel session. Uh, now our last speaker for, for today's proceedings. I'd like to invite Linda McBride-Uke to the stage. Linda belongs to the Bunjalung and the Butchala and the Wapabara Nations, very coastal groups of people. She has a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Queensland in Political Science and History. She's a postgraduate diploma in Creative Industries. She was an Aboriginal editor with the State Library of Queensland, Unique Black and Right, Indigenous Writing and Editing Team. So please welcome Linda. Hello everyone, uh, I am from two different language groups, so I, I have a cultural obligation I'd like to now fulfil, and that is to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of where we're having this um, seminar this afternoon. I'd like to also thank the organisers 
for giving me the opportunity to share the special men in my life who served in the Australian Defence Force. Uh, there are images and names of people who have been deceased, so I need to warn, to warn you about that. And I guess what I'm presenting today is a personal... Um, I'm, be, I'm being personally driven to do this to honour um, the men in my family. So there's different levels of research. So there's obviously the individual one-on-one -on -one family research, and then there's regional research, and like the national one that Dale works with. So there's different levels, and mine is very personal. So, um, and I've had help too. I've talked to Dale. I've talked to Gary, whoever Gary is, or oh, Gary, um, and also Des. You know, just a phone call. What is that? What is that badge? Or it's not a badge. Uh, um, what does that mean? So I'd like to thank them for giving me some direction. Okay. That's my grandfather, William Uke. And that's my uncle. And I don't know which one, but I, I think I found out our uh, William and, sorry, William and um, Senior and Junior. So that was in the early 1940s. Uh, Gary helped me identify what that feather in his cap meant. And that's my father. And I can get these photographs fixed, but I like to think it's like a good bottle of wine. I like to keep it there. It gives a bit of, you know, it's been, you know, through the mill and back. This is my cousin, Glenn McBride, on the left. My dad and my um, cousin, Lindsay Williams. You'll see him in a minute. Okay, now this is... Uh, that fellow that was had his arms, all that hair. This is him now in the in the military. Now he served in the Fifth uh, Battalion Works Corp unit, and he went overseas. He was in the Middle East. Now this is his record, uh, army records that the family collected. He won six medals. <laughs> You know, the 1929-45 star, the Africa star, the Pacific star, the Defence Medal, the War Medal, and the Australian Service Medal for services overseas in the Middle East. I mean, six medals. I mean, of course he should have been awarded like anyone else that went into that kind of horrendous battleground. And to come back sane would be a miracle for anyone. <clears throat> and that's my mum and dad. Uh, my dad was courting my mum at the time. So they were just like courting or engaged at, um, in that stage. And that's um, Aunty Gloria Daylight. He's a good friend of my mum and dad, of course, with mum and dad. There they are on their wedding day. He got her. <laughs> He wore her down or she wore him down, I don't know. But what a handsome couple. I don't think I need Gary to tell me about the feather in mum's cap there. That's just a fashion statement. <laughs> but um, there they are. And to steal a line from Rory, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> now, what happened was Dad didn't get his medals until 50 years later. There's a story to that, of course, it won't be told here, but he was presented with, with that at Government House. And uh, the next day, the Courier Mail, there was a photograph of my father with his medals and my daughter, and it went national, was so proud. That better, you know that saying, better late than never? It applies here. How many men of our men and, and women have passed away without getting their medals that are still sitting in offices? So if you've got that kind of personal drive to find out for your own family and your father or grandfather, I think it's, a, it, it's another way of honouring them. 
Also, as part of the celebrations, the Brisbane City Council named a park after our father, and that was a combination of his war service and his um, social, political, uh, kind of um, social justice uh, movement through the Queensland Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, Council, which is like a, a social in the 60s fighting for Aboriginal rights. Now, that's unusual because a lot of Aboriginal people... OK, take that back, not a lot. There are Aboriginal people who um, are acknowledged in parks, a lot on missions and reserves. So, for example... This, this is the only way I can give you an example, like maybe in Cherbourg, it might be the Birdie Button Park or the, you know, whoever. But in a major city, for an Aboriginal person, the capital of the state, to get a, a, a park is unbelievable. And I believe that Uncle, is it the pilot? He's got a park dedicated in Ipswich. Uncle Glen Waters, Glenn, um, Glenn Waters Park in Anala. So we've got two. Oh, yes, sorry. My, my apologies. So there you go. Um, the, the, the Davies, is it Davies Park. Okay. So at Bald Hills. Okay. So there you go. Now, this is um, my uncle William Uke. Now, he's my father, even though his name's McBride, his father was all Uke. So he, he would have been Lambert Uke, but I won't go into the family ancestry. <laughs> um, Uncle William, Uncle Bill, Uncle Stan and Uncle Les and Dad are all brothers. So I just wanted to clarify that. And when I've got there the second light horseman militia unit, that's exactly what it is because that's why I rang Gary. I said, what does that feather symbolise? What does it mean? And as you can see there, it's the courtesy of um, my cousin Michael Ed. The same photograph that Rory had. Um, Uncle Stan Uke. Okay, I'll just go back. So you've got four brothers all serving in World War II. Some go overseas and see, um, you know, action in the Middle East and uh, other areas. Some don't go overseas. And Dad was in Townsville when Townsville was bombed by the Japanese. Everyone focuses on Darwin, and rightly so. But because um, I guess in Townsville, no one got killed, thank goodness. But, but Townsville did get bombed. Okay. So we're getting a little bit closer now to the generation um, after the World War II. This is a cousin um, who served in Vietnam. Now, I was told that the highest non commissioned rank is regimental sergeant major. That's why RSM is there. Is that correct? Okay, good. So um, now Bob's just got off a ship. A ship's just pulled in the port with all the Vietnam troops. They still got their their weapons on them, and that little girl is now fifty. Who's had her fiftieth wedding anniversary? Ah, uh, sorry, our birthday. But Bob was a career soldier, and um, he he's an interesting person to talk to, to say the least. Okay, so what I wanted to do, that is like the old guard or the older generation that are coming up. So I want to kind of insert in this uh, presentation something very important. I want you to have a look at that uh, while I just have a quick drink of water. <coughs> Okay, this is the McBrides in 1967. In 1966, the population census was taken. The population census is taken every five years. So the next one's not till 1971. So in 1967, 92% of Australians voted for a couple of issues regarding Aboriginal people, and I want to focus on the population census. So they said that Aboriginal people should now be counted in the population census. So that's not going to happen until 1971. 
So when you see down the bottom there, LBMDM, in 1971, I was 14. That's me. That's Linda. Billy was 17. Monica, my older sister, was 29. And my father was 54 and my mother was 55 before we became citizens in this country on the 1971 population census. Now, they knew how many millions of tonnes of wheat, iron ore, cattle, sheep they imported and exported, had no idea how many of Aboriginal or Torres Strait people in this country. Now, that's significant beyond comprehension sometimes. Um, <clears throat> 1971, my maternal grandmother passed away in age 78, never recorded. She just came and went. My other grandmother died in November 1972 and she was counted by the skin of her teeth, but she got counted. Now that's a powerful statement because all the people I've just showed you before were not citizens of this country, but yet went and fought for the country. So I'll let that be absorbed for a minute. Now we're getting into the younger generation. Now, this is Wesley, as it says here, graduated from Duntroon Military College in Canberra. Now I've got there, he served 10 years. I was just going by what Michael told me. So what you're going to see um, unfold before your eyes is now the younger generation are coming through. Now, the ones before were, had limited education. I don't even think that they went to high school. They only had primary school education. So now younger ones are coming through like Wesley and my brother and many others. So the tide's kind of turning about now becoming officers. So here he is, this is my big brother. Now I want you to have a look at how his rank is. He's a naval cadet there. He's a baby, he's only 17. You have a look at by the time this last slide, what he looks like and what rank he is. And that is the training centre where all Navy recruits go. And you notice the date, 1972. So guess what, he was a citizen. Just, yep. There he is, he's now an able seaman. And Cuttable's in Sydney. He's a leading seaman at Harmon, which is in Canberra. Notice the beard? I mean, how could you not? <laughs> and uh, apparently, Bill said in the Navy, you must go in, knock on the door to the captain or lieutenant and say, sir, permission to grow a beard. Yes, McBride grows a beard, has it for about God knows how many years, goes back, sir, permission to shave. That's the military. <laughs> now, this is um, uh, naval exercises. Now, the far left is the Australian HMAS Melbourne, the only aircraft carrier we ever had, and we don't have one anymore. Is that right, Gary? We had three. We had three. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, then, okay, lovely. And HMAS Sydney was an aircraft carrier. Okay, so that one is HMAS Melbourne, and in the front is the USS Enterprise. Now, look at the difference in size. So, I'm not here to say the Yanks have got the biggest and the best. On the contrary, I'm here to say the Australian Navy pilots are one of the deadliest pilots in the world. Because look at the flight, the length of that flight deck they have to land on, and look at what the Yanks have got to land on. <laughs> God's <it's> truth. <laughs> so, an anecdotal uh, story from my brother when they were in San Diego and, you know, based in the US uh, Navy port, that a lot of the American pilots refused to land on the Melbourne. So this is here to honour 
the Navy pilots, the Australian Navy pilots. There it is in rough seas. Now you look at the flight deck, how close it is to the ocean. I mean, look how it's dipping. And it is a photo, I am going to get it put in, of it when it's actually riding the crest. So when the captain says batten down the hatches, he means batten down the hatches. I mean, who in their right mind would be up there anyway? <laughs> Unless you want to go fishing. <laughs> See if you can get a mullet or two. <laughs> or three. <laughs> now, Bill, when he joined the Navy, had only done grade 10, so he, had, he was limited in his classification. He, be, he was a steward, which is a Navy fancy word for us, a bartender. But the Navy is wonderful, and the military is, because Bill did his grade 11 and 12 in the Navy. So as soon as he's got his senior, he changed to a photographer because he had the education. So that's where they all go. Uh, and I'm not going to state the obvious. He's obviously the only Navy guy there. <laughs> now, this is just a copy of his um, photography degree. That's him trying out a flash new camera. Um, ben Bill was based in the HMS Kunawara. He went into some competitions which he won. And some of those uh, photographs are hanging up in our, our house. In Kunawara, the Navy photographers, or well, he was one, um, asked to go with customs, because what they do is they fly, and Gary, you can help me if I've got this wrong, they fly with customs and take photographs of illegal fishermen in our waters, send out the coordinates to a Navy ship, longitude, blah, 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 latitude, the Navy ship locks in, and they go on to sail to apprehend them, and then that photograph is used in evidence in court. Am I right? <laughs> so what a job. What a job. That's one of the people, this is now some of the people he's taken photos of. I haven't got the year because I don't know what year the, that particular pope came out, but... Sorry? 1986. Okay. <clears throat> now, Billy was six foot one. Malcolm Fraser's, what, six foot five? Maybe. Look how he's, oh, he's kind of got his head tilted. <coughs> yep. <coughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> He's not one of my old flames. I was going to have a little tongue hanging out, but I thought I'd better not. <laughs> yeah, better behave myself. <laughs> now, Bill went into a Pacific, um, as it says, periscope photography, an elite component of photography. Periscope photography, for crying out loud. So, of course, he was um, at HMA Sterling, um, which is a naval base, a uh, submarine base in Western Australia, in Rockingham or Perth. And there is a submarine base on the east coast, or used to be. But anyway, that's why he was uh, allocated to the submarines there. Yeah. And being a big man, one of the stories he told me was um, when he was asleep, when the submarine's diving, he said, it's like someone... Is at the end of his bed and holding it up. You get the sensation. And um, one time the submarine broke down and they were floating. They couldn't go up or down, left or right. So imagine being one and a half kilometres under the ocean in a tube, stuck. And the engineers work frantically in the... Like, you know, it, 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 they fixed it. It went back to the surface and they limped back in the port and Bill said... The engineers were drunk for three days <laughs> from all the sailors, you know, saying, thanks, mate. <laughs> so, there, it's part of his training. Don't ask me how you escape from a submarine one and a half kilometres under the ocean. I don't know. But anyway, I, I, sorry? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now... 
one of the other things I'm very proud of Bill, he got international recognition for an article he wrote about safety in depth. As you can see, that was from the United States Naval Institute from Annapolis, confirming that his article is going to be published in that, in that uh, um, publication. So that's another wonderful thing he achieved. <clears throat> I'll let that speak for itself. I can tell you now, Navy guys, especially with their summer whites, you're not allowed to have a mark on it. They wouldn't be standing that close because it would get scorched. <laughs> now, Bill became an alcohol and drug counsellor also, in addition to his photography. And one of the lovely stories he told was that... Um, that if the younger sailors played up, drunk on a weekend in the city and they'd go back to base, the captain would say, oh, you've got to go and see a drug and alcohol counsellor. And Bill would say, they'd walk in and they'd go, because there's an Aboriginal guy standing there to tell them about drug and alcohol. I'd be, <laughs> he said, so <laughs> when I got over the shock of a black fella standing there, they got into it, you know. So... <laughs> So um, he was very dedicated to that. Uh, this is when he got the Conspicuous Service Medal Award from the New South Wales Governor General. So the whole family attended that. That was a fantastic day. That's just his business card. There he is in his... Aren't they gorgeous, the men? And he... Graduated from Edith Cowan University. So remember I mentioned education? Remember I said to my old fellas, probably only went to primary school? He's Wesley in Duntroon. He's Billy graduating. They're getting all well educated. There's nothing to stop anybody now in the military with our people. And this is him graduating there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks. So that concludes our presentations. Uh, we're, I'm going to. We've got to finish at 2.25, so we won't be able to have the panel of speakers this afternoon, but please um, come and speak to Rory or Sally, Uncle Eric or Linda um, after we conclude. Um, some closing comments, and, and I just wanted to say as a young um, Indigenous Australian uh, how proud I am of our heritage and how proud I am of our history. And every time I get to learn a bit more of our history through events like this, um, it really, really um, inspires me, just the strength of our, our generations who have gone before us. And I personally wanted to thank all the people who presented today. Um, I think the, the contributions, the sacrifices that you make in collecting this, and there, there might not be a lot of love, but certainly the work that you're doing, I think will live on for many generations. So I want to applaud you all for your contribution that you're making to recognise our history as Indigenous Australians and our history as Australians. I and mean, we can all take something away from those men and women who have served this country. Um, and we can take something away from your work. So I want to thank you all for that. In closing, I'd like to invite our host again to the stage, the State Librarian, Jeanette Wright, to um, give some closing comments. Thank you, Joshua. And I'm absolutely amazed at the stories we've heard today, and I'm so pleased that we've begun on this journey together to uncover more stories. And I hope that we can take uh, your advice about how we capture those stories for the future, because our whole Q Anzac 100 Memories for a New Generation project is about uncovering the untold stories. And the Indigenous stories are largely untold, as we've discovered today. And uh, we hope that that uh, continues. I want to remind you to check out our website in relation to the fellowships that I talked about this morning. And I'd also like to draw attention to the fact that we have... I'm obviously going over time too. But I just want to draw attention to the fact that the QANZAC, um, the state... Um, 
uh, Anzac Centenary program has over this four year period <coughs> applications for community grants. And many of the projects that people have talked about today, uh, whether they're events or monuments or whether that's uh, repair and replacement of monuments, as I heard today, uh, they're eligible as well as the kind of research projects that we uh, want to encourage and we would inc invite you to work with us on those. And I have a, a little thank you for Joshua. Um, thank you. For being... <laughs> for being such a, a, a good master of ceremonies today and finishing on time and, and on all of the sessions. And we've, we've actually given him some tickets to Black Diggers. And, and, and we hope that those of you who haven't already uh, been to the show will get along. It's running till the 12th of October at QPAC. And there'll be a live broadcast on um, Wednesday, 8th of October at 6 p.m. And we'd encourage you to um, to tune into that or to actually go to the show while it's on because that was part of the impetus for us having this forum here today. Thank you all and let's stay on the journey together. Oh, uh, a comment. Can I just share a story from Uncle Cess Fisher? You know, um, people who don't know who Uncle Cess Fisher was, uh, he was... Uh, a great humanitarian. He worked for uh, human rights here in, in Brisbane and I was fortunate enough to meet with him. And he told me a story about when he came back from Korea and uh, him and his army mates, they've lobbed back in Australia and they've gone to a pub to have a beer. And the publican refused him beer, refused him service. You know, he was an Aboriginal man. We couldn't drink in hotels in those days. And anyway, he's non-Indigenous, white fellow, uh, brothers in arms. And look, Uncle says he used more choice language than I'm going to use. They wrecked the pub. They absolutely trashed it and they said, you're not effing serving a beer here today, are you? And that's the sentiments of uh, the other uh, brothers in arms and sisters in arms. And uh, yeah, good story. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. And we will finish now.